Today, a fitting subject for our graduation Sunday as we have some of our young ones who are about to launch into their lives. Uh, we're going to talk today about failure to launch and talk today about failure to launch. Uh, some years back, there was a movie about this. Uh, the movie had um, Matthew McConaughey in it. Um, he played a, uh, a very grown adult man who was still living in his parents' basement, um, and uh, he just, for some reason, just couldn't, couldn't launch. He couldn't get out. Um, and I, it was a, it, I guess it was a good movie. I, I think part of it was filmed in my uh, wife's hometown uh, in Alabama. Um, it's an interesting tidbit there. But it was one of those movies. And, and I, you know, we all, we all can envision that. There's this, uh, this expectation that I think is mostly just American. You know, you go to other parts of the world and this isn't the case. Um, that, but there's this expectation that our children will leave the home at 18 and hopefully never have to come back and... And, and if they don't leave, this is sometimes called failure to launch. Honestly, honestly, this is not what we're talking about this morning, but honestly, this is an expectation that other parts of the world do not have. Uh, and, and this isn't really the topic of the sermon, but, but you, you can all imagine this person, you know, it's like a, you know, a 30-year-old man, bearded man with video game controller in one hand, Mountain Dew in the other hand, chicken tendy in mouth. Uh, pajamas still on at 2 p.m. It's dark in the basement, uh, just, you know, gaming it up, living his best life, right? I mean, we can all envision that and picture that. Uh, but really, that, that's not what we're talking about today. As we send our graduates off to the next chapter of their lives, I want to speak for a few minutes about the need for them to launch in the direction of Jesus. A failure to launch would be a failure to launch in Jesus' direction. And, and, and I want to talk about maintaining that trajectory even after you leave the home. Even, even after you leave the home, launching in the direction of Jesus and maintaining that trajectory even after you leave the home. So I want to remind everybody before we talk about this, what this launch needs to look like, I want to remind everybody of the first point that we made in this series on the family. The first, very first point that we made in this series on the family is to remember the most important thing. Remember the most important thing. John chapter 15 verses 4 through 6 says, uh, Jesus says this, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. Jesus is speaking to his disciples, but I think that he's speaking to us. He's speaking to us as individuals. He's speaking to us as families. The most important thing, the most important thing is that we stay connected to God. That's it. That's it. It's more important than the education we get. It's more important than the job we get. It's more important than, um, and all of those sort of filter into that and kind of extend from being connected to God, I believe. But, but it is the most important thing. And in order for us to have a trajectory that points to Jesus and to maintain that trajectory throughout our lives, in order for us to do that, we have to be connected to God. And so I say this to those seniors who are about to, to graduate, who are about to start a new chapter of your lives. I want you to, to be able to say this. I want you to be able to remember this. The most important thing is to be connected to God. He is our life. He is the truth. He is the way to salvation. He is the one who is going to teach us and mold us and shape us and bear fruit in our lives. So, with that in mind, the most important thing, I want to talk about our launch. 
into life. And this is for the, the seniors that are graduating. This is for uh, the people who have, have started their lives and maybe need to get back on track. This is for the people who are raising children and, 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 and you're looking to, to make sure that they're ready for the time that they launch, the time that they start their life of faith beyond your household. And so I've got three points this morning, and I hope that you'll join me in looking at these passages. I'm going to try and keep this mercifully short and sweet. Point number one. Point number one, it is the final countdown. It's the final countdown. So make sure you're prepared. It's the final countdown, so make sure you're prepared. I've been going back and forth. Should I sing the Europe song while I'm up here? I don't know. I, I shouldn't. I shouldn't. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. Um, it is the final countdown, so make sure that you're prepared. I want you to turn your Bibles and look at 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 20 through 22. Uh, Timothy is one of those books that um, it is simultaneously very practical, but also uh, sometimes seems not very practical. And the reason for that is Timothy is, is being written, it's a letter written from Paul to Timothy, and it's being written to Timothy as he is a young preacher. Okay? So it has a lot of practicality for people who are going into ministry, who are going to, to serve in a church somewhere, um, very practical. But it also is practical um, in the sense that Timothy is very young. He's a young person. And Paul calls him a young man, a youth. And, and so Paul is giving instructions to this guy as a minister, but he's also giving instructions to this guy as a young person. And so it's very, very practical for young people. And he says this in 2 Timothy chapter 2, starting with verse 20. Now, in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honorable use, some for dishonorable. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. So flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Paul is hearkening his, his reader's mind back to the Old Testament. Back to the Old Testament where if you had some sort of a dish, let's say you had a cup, in order for, for you to be able to drink out of that cup and use that cup, that cup had to be purified, okay? The same way we do now. If you don't have a cup that's dirty and nasty and gross and, and pick it up and you can notice that it's dirty and nasty and gross and, you know, maybe it has last week's sweet tea in it or, or if, in your, if you're in my house, it's got uh, last week's milk in it. Uh, that's now cottage cheese or, you know, something like that. But uh, you, don't, you don't pick up... It, that doesn't happen. That doesn't really happen. That would be gross. Um, <laughs> you don't pick up that cup and, and you see that it's gross and say, eh, and then fill it up and start drinking from it. You don't, you don't do that. Okay? So in the same way, uh, they had these laws of purification. If, if you didn't clean the cup, uh, then, then you would become unclean. And, and Paul is telling Timothy, he's using this as an illustration, he's telling Timothy, Timothy, you need to make sure that you are a vessel that is prepared for God's use. You need to make sure that you are a vessel that is prepared for God's use. Make sure that you are ready for God to use you, that you are prepared Okay, you can't, you can't be unclean, you can't be, uh, you can't be not useful to the master of the house. So Paul tells Timothy, you need to make sure that you are ready for God's use, for honorable use. So set yourself apart as holy, he says. Set yourself apart as holy, as someone who is, is holy and is useful to God, can be used for God's purposes. And so he says in verse 22, Flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace. He's telling Timothy, Timothy, even though you're young, even though you have your life ahead of you, take this seriously and be someone that God can use 
in this world. Take this seriously and be someone that God can use in this world. Contrary to popular belief, our young people, 17, 18, 16 year olds, 15 year olds, our young people can be serious about their relationship and life with God. They can. They just can. They can be serious about this. And that's why Paul tells Timothy, you, you flee youthful passions. You know, d- don't, don't be so focused on what everybody else says you need to do. Flee those things and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace. I'm not saying don't enjoy life, but I'm saying be serious and ready for the things that matter. Because even though you're young, you can be useful to God especially because you're young, you can be useful to God. And so be ready. It's the final countdown, so make sure that you are prepared. You are about to to leave the home. Or maybe you've already left the home. Or maybe you have children who are going to one day leave the home. Make sure that they're prepared. Help them to pursue faith and righteousness and love and peace with God. These ought to be something that is truly important in our houses and in our lives. And so for those that, that of you that are graduating, that are moving on, or those that have recently done that, I want to encourage you. Find out what kind of vessel you are for Jesus. Maybe you are a vessel that gives water to a weary and thirsty person. Maybe God is calling on you to be kind and merciful to other people and to be a point of mercy and goodness for them. Maybe you are a a vessel that says to the world, come and talk to me about God. I don't know what your talent is. I don't know what your uh, usefulness is, but but I, I want you to find out what that is and use it for God's glory and be prepared Be prepared because it's the final countdown. Number two. Number two, it is the final frontier. It is the final frontier, so keep your eyes on Jesus. It's the final frontier, so keep your eyes on Jesus. If you have prepared yourself to be a vessel for God's holiness, to be useful for God, to to use your talents for God, if you've prepared yourself for that and and, and you've fleed the youthful passions and you have put your mind and set your mind to pursue righteousness and faith and love and peace, I want to encourage you to be someone who continues to keep your eyes on Jesus. Don't let them waver. Don't let them wander because you're going to be tempted. You're going to be pushed to let them wander. It's just going to happen. That is something that is absolutely going to happen to you. It's going to happen in college. It's going to happen in your career after college. It's going to happen when you have kids and they want to do a million different things and you have a million different priorities and obligations. It's going to happen. And I just want to encourage you to keep your eyes on Jesus. I want you to listen to this passage. Hebrews 12, verses 1 and 2. Hebrews 12, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. The Hebrews writer is talking about Hebrews chapter 11, these great people of faith, Moses and Abraham and David. Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, these people who had great faith, let us also do this. Let us also lay aside every weight in the sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Do we have any runners in here? Any people that run? <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay, all right. I, really? Okay, all right. You guys are you're great in my book. Uh, I don't run either. Do we have any people that run, you know, for like exercise, need a jog? You know, or run on the treadmill, or maybe you one of those people that walks swiftly and you do that weird thing with your hips, you know, the speed walkers. Okay? All right. I, I, I run. I run only when chased. Um, but but I run and I, I'm I'm you know I'm not I'm not very good at it as, as you could probably tell, and, and maybe some of you aren't very good at it, but all of us are running 
a race, so to speak. We are running an endurance race through this life. And Jesus is at the finish line. And the Hebrews writer says, you are surrounded by all of these witnesses who have also run the race, who did it out of faith and love for God, and they're cheering you on. You know, maybe some of them have got the little cup of water, you know, that cup of water that no one ever actually gets in their mouth. You know, like they run by and they grab it, half the water spills out when they grab it, and then they miss their mouth, it just falls, you know, like behind their head. Okay? Maybe may, they're, they're, all these people are cheering you on. They're, they're, they're right there. They're saying, you can do it. And you're running this race. And, and the Hebrews writer says, I want you to lay aside every weight. I want you to lay aside every weight. And the sin which clings so closely, let us lay aside those things that make it hard to run this race, that make it hard to run with endurance. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. Looking to Jesus. We're going to run a race, whether we like it or not, an endurance race to the end of our lives. And at the end, there will be an award ceremony. And it won't be who finished first or who finished the fastest or who looked the best when they were doing it. It'll be the people who endured and did it. It'll be the people who endured and did it. But some of us will be distracted. Some of us will have extra weight on us. Some of us will get distracted and go off in this direction or go off in that direction or uh, we, there, there will be something that happens in our lives. In fact, I think all of us will probably get to this point where something will distract us from our race or make us slow down or make us stop. And the Hebrews writer is saying, you continue on, you keep going and look to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Look to Jesus. Use his example of endurance to goad yourself on, to encourage yourself to move on. Use his example of, of, of the, the, the fact that he could have called 10,000 angels, but he didn't. When they were nailing nails through his hands, he could have called 10,000 angels, but he didn't. When they were putting nails through his feet, he could have called 10,000 angels, but he didn't. When they were mocking him as he hung upon the cross, he could have said, I don't want to do this anymore. But he didn't. Because of the joy that was set before him. He knew that in doing that, in enduring the cross, he was securing the salvation of all people who come, come to him in faith and obedience. And so keep your eyes on Jesus in this race. When you go to college or when you go to, off to school or, or when you get a career or when you get older and you have kids, there, it is going to be a constant battle from Satan to get your attention somewhere else. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep your trajectory toward Him. Find a good church family. Make sure that you are, 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 are engaging in, in spiritual disciplines and praying and, and, and reading Scripture and being around other people of like faith. Make sure that you're doing that. Keep your eyes on Jesus. This is the final frontier. This is the, the, the next chapter of your lives. Finally, number three. Number three, live long and prosper. <laughs> live long and prosper. I can't do it. Can you guys do it? Like I do it and my fingers come down. I've got like a weird, I don't know, I just can't. I'm weak. I don't know. Live long and prosper. Live long and prosper. Our scripture reading this morning, Psalm 1, 1 through 6, is the best passage that I know for this. Because the psalmist is explaining and teaching that 
there's a certain way to live that will be prosperous, ultimately speaking, and there's a certain way to live that will be detrimental to you, ultimately speaking. And you need to make that decision. And so after we have considered that it's the final countdown and that we've prepared ourselves, we become people who are pursuing righteousness and faith and love and peace. After we've made that decision and, and after we've decided, you know what, I am going to keep my eyes on Jesus. I'm going to continue and maintain the fact that I am a useful um, vessel for God and His holiness and His purposes. After we've decided that, that, let us make the decision to live long and prosper, to live the best life we can possibly live. Now, there are all kinds of competing ideas of what that is. The valedictorian of my high school, he said, let's go uh, get jobs, let's get rich, let's make lots of money, and let's party. That was, that was his, yeah, that was his uh, valedictorian speech. It was very, you know, it was, it was, it was great. It's awesome. Um, <laughs> that, was, that was wonderful. It was so inspiring. Uh, let's get rich, let's make lots of money, let's party it up. Okay, I mean, that was, that was his idea. That was his idea of living long and prospering, and, and I, you know, there may be some of that in life, I don't know, but, but here is what the prosperous person looks like. Psalm 1, 1 through 6, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. There's, there's this picture of, of this person who progressively gets more and more deeper and deeper into a, an unprofitable lifestyle, a sinful lifestyle. First, he's pictured as someone who's walking around other people who are wicked, just walking with the wicked. And then he's pictured as, as someone who's standing with sinners. He's no longer walking, he's standing, he's standing with them, and then he sits in the seat of scoffers. Now he's sitting down, he's taken his seat in that lifestyle. But the blessed man, the blessed man is the one who delights in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. He is like a tree. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season. And its leaf does not wither. I mean, he's like this mighty oak that's planted by the water and, and it has water for its roots and it produces fruit and it is beautiful and it is unshakable. I mean, the trunk is thick. It has deep roots. It's not going anywhere. It's going to live and live prosperously. Verse 4, the wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. They're like the, the little pieces of, of, of plant that, that get blown away by the wind. They have no root. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment. You may stand, in verse 1, in the way of sinners, but they will not stand in the judgment. Nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Whatever it is that you do with your life. I don't know what your career is going to be. I don't know what your plans for education are going to be. I don't, I don't know where it is that you're going in your life. I'd like to know. I'd love to, to hear about those things. But whatever it is, maybe you don't even know. But whatever it is, please let it be the prosperous life. Please let it be the prosperous life. Live long and prosper. Live the best life you can live. And that is the person who is blessed by God, whose delight is in the law of the Lord, who meditates on it day and night. That's the blessed person. I want to conclude this by saying I'm proud of our graduates. I'm proud of our graduates. You finished a great thing. You have accomplished a great thing, and you're moving on. What I want you to do it's to not have a failure to launch in the right direction, but launch toward Jesus. All these other things will work out. You'll finish school, and you'll get a career. And if you want a family, you'll have a family. If you want to, to uh, live in a certain place, you'll live in a certain place, and you can do all of those still things and still have the trajectory toward God. 
but maintain that direction toward God. Prepare yourself because it's the final countdown. Keep your eyes on Jesus because we're in the final frontier now of your life and live long and prosper. I want you guys to know that I'm praying for you. I'm thinking about you. Those of you who have young ones coming up who this is going to be a day sometime in the future, I'm thinking about you. I'm praying about you. Those who have already launched one out, I'm thinking about you and I'm praying about you. Those who launched a long, long time ago and who fa still faithfully are trying to keep their eyes on Jesus and trying to be a vessel for God's use, I'm thinking about you and I'm praying for you. Let's pray and then we'll sing our invitation song. Great God, we're thankful for all that you do. God, you are a good God. You are a merciful God. I pray that you would bless everyone in this room that you would bless them, that you would build them up, that you would lead them and guide them. God, that you would just be what each one of us needs you to be for us, a rock, a fortress. God, I pray that you would be specifically with these graduates who are moving on, who are going on to a new chapter. God, I pray that you would keep their focus. Pray that you would help them to keep their focus on you. And everyone, everything else will fall into place. God, I pray that you would be with us as we grow older and that you would help us to keep our focus on you. We love you so much. In Jesus' name, we pray these things. Amen. If you need something today, we'd love to help you. We'd love to pray with you. We'd love for you to respond to this invitation. We're going to stand and we're going to sing a song. You can come sit on one of these front pews and talk with me. You can talk with me privately. Whatever it is that you need. Won't you please come as we stand and as we sing.